I'm John Chapman. I'm uh, a senior advisor for, uh, for global engagements with Internet2 and chair of the Middle East Special Interest Group. Uh, I'll be chairing this section. Uh, please bear with us a little bit. We have a few technical challenges. We're going to do the best we can with what we have. Um, so our first speaker will be Carl Meyer, who's uh, a program management officer with Geon, and he's going to be talking about Geon services. So I'm going to just queue him up, and then uh, we'll get started. No, you need to move up a bit. I can't see that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm hoping that you can all hear me. Uh, we seem to be having some problems in that I can't hear anything from your end. Um, equally, um, because I'm on a full screen now, I can't actually see any messages being sent to me. Uh, so I'm hoping that you're all there. Um, I'm really sorry about the technical difficulties you seem to be having. But this network itself actually is just part of what we do. And what we do is connect this European network to the rest of the world. We provide a hub for interconnectivity around the world, across Africa, the Middle East, the Far East, South America, and North America. And this truly makes a global collaboration possible. These are services that are absolutely essential to us all. The Jeanne Network Services are designed for research and education. They are highly robust. We provide uh, connectivity for thousands of terabytes of data every single day. Highly available um, and extremely flexible. And it's this flexibility, this tailoring to the needs of research and education, which makes us very different to the rest of commercial internet service providers and network providers. Uh, and we have essentially four families of networking services. The IP service, which is possibly the most visible service that people understand, uh, connecting all of the research education networks around the world um, at an IP level. We also have point-to-point uh, -point services, um, including Lambda services for extreme high bandwidth. But we are also developing a range of virtual private networking services and open interconnectivity services. And it's these virtual private network services and open interconnectivity services which allow research and education organizations and institutions around the world to really interconnect and work together. The open service is available to not only research education networks but also commercial organizations so that we can engage in a, a great deal of public-private partnership activities, particularly in things like cloud services. And as CERN said, it would not be possible for them to work without the network that Jayant and the NRENs have provided. Uh, we provide a huge network to CERN to allow it to connect to its data centers and also for researchers around the world to connect to CERN. Without those networks, then the work of CERN would be uh, largely irrelevant. But most importantly, we have the value-added services, which really help to drive collaboration. And these are services that physically touch the users, services such as EduRome, uh, roaming Wi-Fi service, EduGain, single sign-on AI services, and the full range of other services in this in area are absolutely vital to collaboration. Uh, as an example, EduRome has literally billions of authentications every single year. We connect to currently 89 territories. Uh, the blue shaded on there shows literally how far we can spread EduRome message. And it is a worldwide success story. It is a hugely successful operation. Free Wi-Fi at point of use to millions upon millions of researchers, students, academics, staff around the world. EduGain takes that even further, providing single sign-on access to resources. We have three, over 3,000 entities involved in EduGain, allowing researchers, students from all of the universities in those countries to interconnect with resources in other places around the world using their existing institutional logins. So it's highly safe and secure, fast and easy to use and really makes collaboration so much easier. Certainly collaborations on an individual basis where people need to access a service quickly, 
use the information and then get out of that service, it makes EduGain makes that so much easier for them to do. Other value-added services which we offer, we offer a TCS, a Trusted Certificate Service, um, unlimited service certificates for R&E use. So this is certificates for websites, for application servers, for virtual machines in cloud services, for Wi-Fi hotspots. All of these certificate services need certificates to secure the data going across them, to identify them securely to the users. And TCS provides a very, very flexible, scalable way of making sure those services are secured. Again, before about um, intermittent use of services, so people bring coming together in teams for short periods of time for specific projects or specific research. Edu Teams helps that collaboration work better by adding identity and authentication to those people, so that teams can be built, managed, broken down very, very quickly, very, very easily. And of course, the performance of networks is in, is vital and our EduPert and Persona services allow the monitoring and managing of network and service performance um, across the world to really help to make sure that what we are providing for our users is absolutely crucial and is absolutely the best performance possible. Because this is why we do research and education networking and why NRINs exist. We support enable users. We are not profit organizations. We don't have customers. We have users and we develop services to meet the needs of those users. We don't try and fit customers into existing services in order to maximize our profits. We are maximizing the benefit to our users. And this is a real crucial philosophical difference between ourselves and commercial providers. The users are key, and it is vital we never forget this. 100% user focus is essential to the success of research and education networking around the world across every single sphere, sphere of research, from arts and humanities to earth sciences, observation, high energy physics, all of these are using our services and we need to focus on those users. A couple of examples here. Uh, we, so we do some work with the Royal Danish Music Academy, using our network to support designing, enabling musical students and teachers from around the world to work together without boundaries, without borders. And this is enabled by the investment in these networks and in these services. <coughs> and the most recent thing in particular in the news recently, the LIGO and Virgo announcements of gravitational waves from neutron stars. This involved three and a half thousand scientists in five continents using different systems and different services, all able to utilize the data that we provided and shared across our networks. Without those networks and without those AI services, then this research could not have happened as quickly and as easily as it did. And this is where we need to focus on both the high end of research and education, those big users with big science, and also the smaller, the, the more simple users who are not doing IT. They are not spending their time making IT services, de developing software, building web servers. They just simply want to use our services. And these are going to be the people who are going to benefit the most from our service portfolio and the service portfolio of research and education networks around the world. So it's newcomers, new organizations. They, we're now working in a model which is much more distributed across every field from archaeology to high energy physics. These people are working across boundaries, across institutions, across borders. And we're looking at new ways of sharing knowledge with Moodles, with e-learning, digital libraries, online training courses. We're no longer in the mode of having a lecture at the front of a room talking to a small group of people. We are now talking to the world and teaching the world. And we are innovating across all of these areas. We need, as research and education networks, to do this innovation in a user-focused way. So we have to recognize that not all users are the same. 
but we need to support all of these types of users to make sure that they have the best services that they can use in the best way for them. Thank you. And I'm afraid I can't hear any questions, but hopefully somebody might be putting up messages. Oh, hold on, Henri. I've got, can you hear me? Thumbs up. I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can okay. hear you and we can see you. Excellent. That's very good news. Okay, so Henri, uh, the ASREN meeting, we're uh, ready and ready to go. Uh, so, uh, Henri Gomez, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I really want to thank you for this invitation to participate in this new edition of uh, EH and especially Joseph in counting with, uh, with me for this time. So apologies not being present in, in Cairo with you. I would love have to have to, to be there with you. So uh, my name is Enrique Gomez. I work in the European Commission in the Connect in Luxembourg, although I'm addressing you from, from Brussels today, in the unit that is responsible for infrastructures, where I combine the role of uh, uh, project officer, program officer, so on one hand, dealing with uh, projects under uh, Horizon 2020 umbrella, and uh, uh, also drafting uh, policies like the, the recent uh, approved uh, work program 1820, uh, which defines a set of, of calls and instruments with which we are shaping the, the OSC. So I, I think it's very important for me to, to acknowledge the tremendous effort of uh, ASREN in making uh, this event uh, possible, and also I acknowledge the high level of uh, speakers and the quality of the of the program. I mean, uh, gathering in one forum uh, actors outside of the ASREN region, like uh, Géant, the uh, Africa Connect uh, clusters, uh, regional projects like uh, VSIM, uh, even I've seen that you count with the present, uh, the participation of uh, Michael Foley, uh, former specialist at the World Bank. So all those participations send an unmistakable uh, signal that uh, about the openness and the collaborative spirit about the event. And in my view, which is also the European Commission's view, uh, I mean, collaboration is really the way forward for education, science, and research. So in April 2016, the European Commission launched the, uh, the European Cloud Initiative. And since then, the EOS has raised, as you know, a lot of uh, interest, and now it's one of the major endeavors in the, in the Commission. So I, I'm pretty sure that you have in mind, OK, what, what is the EOSC? And honestly, so far, I cannot provide you an answer. I mean, actually, we held in Brussels uh, a, a, serious, a series of back-to-back uh, -back, uh, events about uh, the EOS. So, so we just started with the uh, s freeze uh, info session, uh, followed by the uh, EOS Pilot Stakeholders Forum, and then the last two days on the digital infrastructures for research. So it was a full week dedicated to the EOSC. And at the end of the, of the week, uh, someone very, very relevant on the NRN community said, OK, I'm very happy to see that everyone has a clear vision about what the EOS is. But unfortunately, each one vision is different. So even as, as, as brutal as uh, this uh, answer uh, may seem, I, I guess that shows the complexity that we are, uh, are facing. But what I can tell you is that we have a very clear idea about what is our vision for the EOSC and what do we expect the EOSC uh, to bring. So uh, before going further, let me read you word by word the paragraph in the communication that summarizes the, the EOSC vision. So the, the European Open Science Cloud is a vision for a trusted, federated, globally accessible, multidisciplinary environment where researchers, innovators, companies, and citizens can publish, find, 
use and reuse each other's data, tools, publications, and other outputs for research, innovation, and educational uh, purposes. So this paragraph is full of content, and every word is there for a reason. So I'm not going to cover it all. I mean, that would be a lot of time. But let me elaborate briefly on the on the most relevant aspects. So it's a it has to be a federated environment. So meaning that we are not it's not a brand new. So we are not building the EOS from from scratch, but rather we are integrating the existing uh, infrastructures operating either at a national, regional, or a European level. And again, we have to be very careful with words because uh, integrating in a federated environment, I mean, doesn't mean that we are just merging everything into a into a single entity. Rather, we enable for seamless interoperability. It has to be trusted and accessible, meaning that we have the appropriate access and authorization uh, mechanism to, oper to operate in this federated mode and be able to recognize and empower the right of access uh, of users and also the privacy conditions of, uh, of the data. It has to be global, so no borders. Uh, so the services uh, should support access from uh, from other countries, and again, this is not restricted inside the uh, the European countries. Uh, I mean, as, as you know, the the era, the European research area area, it uh, goes uh, beyond. The, uh, the European Union uh, boundaries. Uh, the same uh, for the uh, Horizon 2020 participation, which is uh, really open uh, to, to many different countries. So the, the EOS cannot be uh, res more restrictive than that. So the implication here of this global approach is that we have to be very, uh, very uh, focused on the choice of uh, standards uh, that allow this true inter interoperability. It has to be multidisciplinary. Uh, for GS, we have this uh, silo approach where astronomers, mathematicians, life science, uh, cultural heritage, uh, high energy physics, etc., each one had uh, its own domain and its own monolithic uh, solution. So in many cases, uh, this means uh, reinventing the wheel on basic services that did not provide any added, uh, added value. And as you can imagine, uh, did not allow for uh, interoperability. So that leads me to the very last point, which is uh, open data. And by open, we don't mean uh, free and uncontrolled. On the contrary, by open, we mean that we adhere to the fair principles, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reducible. And you know that the, the best, uh, uh, the greatest breakthroughs come when we combine ideas uh, from uh, very different uh, fields. So when covering the, uh, the uh, objectives of the EOS, I somehow I have already uh, addressed uh, the main challenges that we are uh, facing as a consequence of the fragmentation of the existing uh, infrastructures. So I'm not going to uh, repeat uh, those, but I just want to add to that has been already mentioned is the challenge on learning and skills. So curriculum in universities and research uh, centers uh, should include uh, the basics of data-driven science. And from the European Commission, we expect the actors involved in the EOS, but not only build uh, this infra and operate the services, but also engage with uh, education and research uh, bodies uh, in these uh, key aspects. So, in the European Commission, we are supporting uh, activities of the infrastructures uh, through uh, projects and grants under, under the uh, Horizon 2020 umbrella. So, this slide uh, gives you an, an, an overview uh, about the, I mean, uh, that shows the fragmentation that I was uh, referring to. So, I don't know if I can. Uh, no, you cannot see my mouse here. Anyway, so um, what we are doing in the current phase is uh, projects like uh, EGI and uh, UDAT. They are uh, coming uh, with, uh, with a joint project that is starting 1st of, um, 
1st of uh, January. Uh, also taking some pieces of technology that uh, are provided by uh, Indigo Data Cloud. Um, all the major actors uh, also, I mean, they're not operating in isolation. Uh, they're actually uh, signing collaboration agreements uh, between them uh, for concrete collaboration actions and, and outcomes. Also, the European Commission has set up an external board of experts for monitoring the gaps and overlaps of those projects, and it, it, uh, they will be issuing uh, recommendations uh, along the way. Other initiatives like uh, ARC and ERG, uh, they continue their support to the infrastructures in the form of uh, uh, frameworks and reference architecture. So uh, it doesn't mean that we are uh, excluding I mean, those not in the picture, uh, they, they will be excluded, uh, on the contrary, but uh, they, will, they will find a way to participate uh, through, the, uh, through the bigger uh, projects. So, and of course, uh, the, the greater the projects, uh, the, the greater the challenge we have about the, the management of those. So, with the following slide, I would like to be a bit more graphical about what is going to be the EOSC role. So today, you can see uh, scientists and researchers, they use the infras as an access mechanism to, uh, to different resources, what I call uh, facilities here, that are sponsored and operation, uh, operated sorry, at uh, national or regional level. So from the uh, European perspective, we are funding those uh, access mechanisms, uh, not the resource themselves. So we fund the access mechanism this is the role of the infras. But the fragmentation that I was referring to you before reflects that, I mean, uh, the same kind of, of services are being offered by different, uh, uh, by different access uh, channels, uh, created some kind of, uh, of overlap. I mean, overlap is not bad, uh, but it, it's not good either if it's not uh, controlled. Uh, but also one of the problems, as I mentioned before, in, of this fragmentation is that those uh, services are not, um, uh, are not somehow uh, interoperable. So with the EOSC, just let me uh, drive the different things. Uh, what we want is, oh, too fast. Uh, what we want is to expose uh, those resources in the form of a, 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 of a catalog of, of services that eventually will evolve into, uh, into a marketplace. So those services will remain free at the point of use for the researcher. Uh, but the European Commission and other agencies we will be able to use the, uh, the EOS as a funding support uh, mechanism based on usage and other metrics. So last but not least, here you can see on this uh, uh, below the European Spencer's Cloud, uh, we have added more blocks which are the EDI, so access to uh, high performance computing resources, also access to the ESPRI, so those are the different uh, verticals, and even the access to uh, commercial uh, services. So I, I have already covered more or less the providers, and I think on the users, I mean, uh, what also we want here is to address what we call the, uh, the long term of, of science, so science not included on the large group uh, that are uh, the main use of data intensive uh, science, but we also want to include, and I uh, repeat, is, this is on the long term, uh, private sector, public authorities, and, and citizens. So I think uh, my time is almost uh, almost up, so even if I had other, other slides, uh, I mean, this is really the, the essence of what we are trying to do with the ESC. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, I can take one question. Do we have any questions? Okay. No questions. Okay. Enrique, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, the managing to be flexible with us as we got the technology going. Okay. No okay. problem. 
Enjoy Wish your day. Wish you an excellent evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enrique, -bye. Uh, thank you again. This is Yusuf. Hello. Just thank you yes. for coming. Uh, for next time, we, we, we wish that you would be with us to have to give us a, a keynote on this, maybe a wider <laughs> update also. See you okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, John. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay. So we've got that. Now we need to see you. Is when the connection went poor. Okay. And disconnect. Yeah, I uh, haven't got I any video from you at all right now. Okay. Uh, let me try to share a screen again. You know, if I do video and share a screen, it's going to take, I'm afraid, too much bandwidth. Let me try to just do share a screen again. Okay. Uh, if it disconnects, I'll call you right back. Okay. Yes, we've got something coming through. And I can okay. see me. Okay. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> Excellent. Full screen. Okay. Okay, and you can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, well, I'm ready when you are. Okay, so introductions. Uh, I'd like to welcome Edward Monahan, who's with the uh, NEAR project out of uh, Indiana University and going to talk to us about uh, the, uh, the NEAR project. And Edward, I'll leave it with you to go on from there. Sure, thank you, John. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Moynihan uh, from Indiana University in the US. Uh, let me start by saying um, and giving my apologies for not being there in person uh, and thanking Youssef and Salem and all my colleagues there uh, for allowing me to come in and do this uh, remotely. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, what I wanted to talk about uh, in this presentation was uh, the NEAR project and how we're working with partners in Europe uh, and Africa to support uh, U.S. science. Uh, and I'd like to focus the talk on how NEAR might be able to collaborate with NRENs uh, and researchers in the Azran region uh, on a few of the specific funded projects that are uh, up Edward can't hear you. Edward? Hi, John. Hey, Edward. Okay, yeah, we lost you there just as you were getting started. Let's try sure. this again. So, so I'm going to try it without the uh, the slides. I think the sharing of the slide deck is what's uh, using all the bandwidth. So maybe I'll just talk for five minutes about 
areas of potential collaboration, uh, and then we can move on. I don't. I, I've been in conferences where this happens, and I don't want the, to annoy anyone anymore. So if you could just give me five minutes to talk without slides. Stop our side. Yeah. Okay. Um, we thought that we might try and stop the video from our side and see if that helps. Okay. Um, let me just. Okay. Do you want to try sharing the slides again, and we'll go with it with, uh, but without our video. Okay. okay. We'll get one more try, and then if not, we'll we'll go voice only. Okay. Can you see my my deck now? Uh, no. So. Spinning. Hang on. Yes. Okay. We got it. Okay. Well, let's try again. Okay. Ready? Ready? Okay. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, sorry for the interruption, everyone. Uh, when I've given this talk at uh, previous conferences, uh, I recognize that very few people in the audience really know where Indiana University is. Where the state of Indiana is, so I prepared this uh, this map of the U.S. Um, to kind of show you where our university is. We're right in the middle of the red state here. Uh, hey, Edward. I've lost him again. Yeah, but all, all of, he's coming from a longer distance. Well, he's coming from a longer distance. Yeah. Well, I was, yeah, I think what I'll do is, okay, let me just, yeah. Let's see if I can get him. Hi, John. Yeah, we're, okay, so the slide deck didn't work. Now, one of the things, we do have a copy of your slides here. If you want me to, if we want to just go voice, and you, I, can just, I can just move slides for you. Okay, yeah, that's, that should be good enough. Okay, so I'm going to kill my video. We've got sound from you, and I have your okay. slide deck up at the very beginning. Okay, uh, you can move to the second slide then. All right. Are you, are you there? I, yeah. I'm on, yeah, I'm on your second slide, yes, which is uh, Collaborations Funding Partners. Okay, so shall I start? Go ahead. Okay, uh, so apologies again. Uh, so uh, let, let me just run through some of this quickly um, so we can get to the important parts, which are the potential areas of collaboration. Um, so uh, quickly, NEAR project uh, is a, a four-year project funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. Uh, it's to support uh, circuits and training and user engagement uh, with U.S. scientists working in Europe and in Africa. Uh, of course, this wouldn't be possible without strong partnerships in the region. And you can see the list of partners here. Uh, it's Indiana University, Jayant, the Mbutina Alliance, Wacker and Azrin, and the South African uh, NRENs. Um, John, move to the next slide, please. Done. Uh, so, again, what is NEAR? Um, NEAR funds a 100 gig circuit that's now uh, in place between uh, the U.S. and Europe, uh, specifically between New York and London. Uh, it's, uh, is it, it's been up uh, almost for a year now from the Manlan Exchange Point to the Jayant Open Exchange in London. 
Um, it's on the Aquacom cable, the AE Connect cable uh, into Dublin, and then extends across to London on the Celtics cable. Uh, this will change uh, when Jayon extends their London to Dublin connection to 100G. I believe that 100G will then stop and uh, in, in terminate in Dublin. Um, the circuit is now part of the ANA consortium, um, or, or soon becoming a formal partner in the ANA consortium. Uh, and we're working now on capacity sharing with ESNet and other members of that consortium. Um, uh, all to say there's now robust connectivity across the Atlantic, something 740 gigs or something, uh, of which the 100 is the NEAR project. Uh, NEAR also has funding to support uh, an exchange point in West Africa. So the European Commission is funding the Africa Connect 2 project, which will support a 10 gig circuit from London to Lagos. Uh, and NEAR is funding the hardware for an open exchange point in Lagos. Oh. Hello? Hey John, do we want to keep trying this, or uh, I don't know if you want to run through my slides and just uh, you know if you get to the end, there are areas of, of collaboration on personar uh, training and small node deployment, and then the main point of the talk. Uh, is on user engagement and you know we're, we're here and open to working with anyone who's interested in helping us uh, look at who's using uh, the network resources, uh, who's not using the resources but might benefit from uh, more outreach and engagement um, and we're looking to help increase utilization of all RNA resources uh, in the path between the U.S. Uh, and, and ASREN. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with, with Salem and Yusuf and going forward uh, to help identify users, to help improve performance, uh, and to help uh, increase the strong bonds between uh, the r &E community in the U.S. and ASRA. Okay. Uh, and I think being able to say that, I think I'm, I'm happy. And if you want to run through more of the slides, if there's questions on Personar, uh, there may be other people in the audience who could help. Um, and I look forward to engaging with the Azure community in the future. And again, apologies um, for not being there in person. Uh, I, I'm saddened and embarrassed to not be there, but I look forward to working with uh, everyone in the future. So John, I'll end it there. Okay, thanks Edward. I'll, uh, I, I can give a quick summary of your slides from, from what I've got here. Thanks okay, very thanks, much. Thanks John. Okay, yep. bye. bye. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid you're going to have to, to go with me rather than Edward. So I, I think you heard a lot of, of a summary to me as to what he'd like to, to really emphasize on. Um, so we, he'd already had a chance to talk about the, uh, the funded circuit through to, uh, uh, yeah, so as he says, uh, you know, the key piece, the, the issues here is, is about measuring and monitoring, and so they're going to be bringing a perf sonar node up, and as you've heard from other, many other speakers, the perf sonar uh, is a key point in getting our networks working with each other, uh, and I, I, think, uh, I think I speak for all of the major NRENs that we, we, we really support the idea of uh, personar nodes out so that we can, then the, the global community can work with you to, to assist in, in troubleshooting as, as you set things up. Um, and you know, their target is to enhance and enable those science collaborations and working with organizations in Africa and Europe. Uh, the, um, the user engagement we're still, Edward may have some more information on this, and I know the last page on his slide does have a connection for him. 
uh, you know, and some contact details. Uh, really important to know who's going to, who, who's looking to use those resources, who's having problem using the resources, who would, could benefit from using the resources, may not know, even know about them yet. So it's what can we do to communicate out this project to, to our user, various user groups, and anything we can do to adopt uh, the, the uh, network uh, opportunities here in the project. Uh, you know, again, I think our speakers, our previous speakers, we've had a lot of com uh, comments from, from various individuals and various organizations that our need to collaborate across domains but also then reach out into the, into the scientist piece. I, I think key, key to this is scientists do science, not the IT support industry and not the IC, IT support team in your, in, in your uh, particular, in the particular university. So that building of relationships with the local NRENs and building the relationships of the NREN out to your members is, is uh, really helps in, in moving this forward. Uh, there are uh, activities that uh, are currently underway with the NEAR project. They are uh, looking at documenting the best practices. Um, you know, uh, documenting the user's potentials, the performance monitoring, which we've mentioned. Uh, targeting that outreach to users. Um, and then promoting the, the RENA uh, adoption throughout, you know, throughout our various regions. Uh, ad advocating and developing. We, 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 we've definitely heard these messages uh, before and uh, looking at how we do consistent performance. So, utilization, justifications, fundings. Okay, I'm going to leave it here. I have another speaker yet to speak. Uh, my apologies to our Aroka colleagues. However, I'm sure you will find this interesting as well. Uh, and let me just cue that up while uh, my next speaker comes up. Kevin. Okay, so our last speaker for the afternoon uh, and in, in this session and for the afternoon of the ASRIN is uh, Kevin uh, Maynell. Maynell, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's Contents and Resource Managers with ISOC and he's going to talk about uh, routing security and the agreed norms there. So, Kevin, and thank you for your patience with us. Oh, that's right. Well, hopefully I won't cut out too much uh, when I'm talking. But it, I think it was a good comparative test between the different video conferencing systems and uh, which ones work well in a constrained environment and which work less well. So maybe a good, good test bed there. Um, so, yes, I'm Kevin Maynard from the Internet Society. Um, and it's actually my first EH uh, conference. But I have um, actually worked in the NREN or the Research and Education Networking um, sector for, for many, many years. I previously worked for Terena. I also worked for Janet, um, the UK NREN in the past as well. So actually my background is much more in this community than um, actually in the wider internet community. But anyway, I'm going to talk about something that's probably of wider interest to, um, to the internet, but also of specific interest to uh, the NRENs as well. Um, we heard a lot in the last two days about how it's important that NRENs are sort of innovative and you know, doing things that a commercial ISP isn't necessarily doing. And I think that this is something that, um, that, that NRENs can maybe take a look at and, and possibly run with and be an example to the uh, rest of the internet. So um, the problem that we're dealing with um, with the internet is that there are um, around 60,000 um, autonomous systems uh, that make up uh, the internet. Um, and as probably most of you know, um, these networks use 
uh, Border Gateway Protocol or BGP to exchange the reachability information um, between themselves so they can work out how to, uh, to send traffic from one network to the next. Um, so this is obviously done, the, the BGP builds, helps the routers build the routing table. Uh, this selects the best route for sending packets, typically based on the shortest path, although not always. Um, and then, of course, the routers use um, AS numbers to identify themselves. So that, that's the basics of how routing works. But BGP is actually almost entirely based on trust, so there really is no um, built-in validation of um, the, the legitimacy of the updates, the routing updates. Um, so it's really based on a gigantic chain of trust that's spanning continents. Um, and this is actually becoming a, a, an increasing issue um, uh, within the internet. You probably heard of some of the incidents, uh, routing incidents, routing security incidents. Um, the famous one was when um, Pakistan Telecom inadvertently took a large section of the internet out uh, with a misconfiguration back in 2008. Uh, there was another incident in 2010 with China Telecom doing something similar. And then I think it was earlier this year, actually Iran um, accidentally took off a large proportion of um, Central Asia off the internet and neighboring regions, um, again, um, for a routing um, uh, issue. So those are the big incidents that you hear about, but uh, you know, this is happening every day. A lot of small incidents, medium-sized incidents, some large ones that then get publicity. But it's happening all the time. So this is something that, that, that kind of needs to be addressed. Um, and what's really happening, so I have limited time, so I'm not going to go through all of the slides, so they should be available, I guess. Um, but there's sort of three ways that this can happen. Um, one is IP, IP prefix hijacking. So uh, a network announces a prefix that it actually doesn't originate um, and then wins this best route, route selection. Um, you can have um, route leaks where they're often due to a misconfiguration um, um, by a network administrator or by an ISP. Um, sometimes it's, it's accidental, sometimes it's, it, it's maybe trying to do some traffic engineering that's, that's not quite worked out correctly, um, but the effects are very, very much the same. And then of course there's uh, IP address spoofing, um, whereby um, IP, IP um, packets are created with false source addresses. Um, and this is a sort of root cause of reflection and distributed denial of service attacks. So there are a number of um, tools that are available um, uh, to help mitigate some of these uh, issues. Um, for example, prefix and AS path filtering, um, RPKI, um, things like the internet routing registries, uh, and also we've had BGP set under development of the IETF. Um, but all of these things are not widely deployed, they're not universally deployed, they're often applied in a piecemeal type of manner. Um, and so, you know, there is no sort of one universal uh, solution to this. And part of the reason for this is from a routing perspective, um, securing your own network doesn't necessarily make that any more secure. Um, actually, your network security is in someone else's hands. Um, so therefore, the more, ha the more networks that are um, undertaking good security measures, the better that the collective security will be um, on the internet. So what we've been trying to do, and this is not specifically an internet society initiative, although we are uh, leading this, um, but we're trying to put together um, a community-led initiative to try to establish some industry norms for um, uh, routing security. So this is called manners, um, obviously a bit of a play on words, as in mind your manners, good manners, um, stands for mutually assured norms for routing security. Um, as I said, this is founded with the goal to imp generally improve the security and reliability of the uh, global routing system based on collaboration and good practice and shared responsibility within the internet infrastructure. So what it means practically, um, Manners is defining four concrete actions that network operators should implement um, and to build this community of similarly minded um, operators. So these are the four actions. Um, in order to become a sort of minus compliant network, um, we ask that um, 
the networks will adopt at least two of these actions, one of which is coordination, but uh, pretty much most of the MANUS participants at the moment are, are actually subscribed to all four actions. So these are, for example, filtering, so preventing the propagation of uh, incorrect routing information. Um, Anti-spoofing, so preventing traffic with spoofed source IP addresses. Um, then we have sort of maybe the more soft action, which is coordination, so ensure that um, the contact information for your network and for other networks is actually valid and that if there is a problem, um, someone will respond from that network and respond quickly to if, you know, when an issue is seen or raised. Um, so that's actually kind of quite an important action, although it's uh, not so much a technical action. And then finally, the uh, global validation. So this is bringing um, into play things like the internet routing registries, uh, uh, RPKI signing your um, address prefixes and AS numbers, uh, and possibly in the future adopting BGP SEC, although that has only just recently published as a standard and there's some issues uh, around whether that's how that's being deployed. So those, those are the four actions. Um, but these are considered a minimal. This is a minimal things that an operator, so a network operator, ISP, NREN, these are the minimal things that they should um, consider, the actions that they should consider to be taking. But the idea is, is that you know, the more operators implement manners, hopefully the fewer routing incidents um, we'll see. So we've been fairly successful in the startup. We've signed up 100 AS numbers um, uh, as part of this um, initiative. Um, but what we're doing is obviously trying to get the word out, get this publicized, get people interested um, and with a view to implementing and signing up to these um, um, principles. We're not claiming that this is a, a complete solution to the uh, security problems or browsing security problems in the internet. Absolutely not. We also want to say this is not specific, I, I want to reiterate this is not specifically an ISOC initiative. We want this to be community led and community driven. So the manners members, you know, they are essentially the owners of this process. Okay, so why, why, what's the case for NRENs to join manners? Well, you know, one thing, how does an NREN distinguish itself from a commercial ISP? Well, you know, you can add, although you're in the main publicly funded, you can add some competitive value and you can uh, you know, demonstrate that you are uh, providing, you know, adopting best practices in the industry and you're operationally effective. Um, but, you know, actually there is a growing demand from customers, whether they are commercial customers or whether they're academic customers. There is this demand, increasing demand for you know, improved security and for um, more managed security um, uh, uh, services. But actually it also shows you know, commitment to your customers. It, it shows that you are a responsible network. It shows that you know how to run a network and that you are committed to the security um, of, your, of your customers. And of course, you know, manners can also apply to the enterprise networks and to the uh, university networks as well. This you know, it's not specifically, have, doesn't specifically have to be a, a, an NREN specific thing. Um, you know, the more um, uh, networks, AS numbers that adopt this, um, the better for everybody. But this is also showing technical leadership. You know, this is an issue that's been that's been raised and is growing in concern. Um, there's lots of discussions at government levels about, about these issues. And actually, as an NREN, you can show as a publicly funded organization that you are actually showing the technical leadership and actually you are you know, ahead of the, the commercial ISPs um, in this area. But yeah, just more generally, I mean, it's, it's an example-led uh, example initiative. Um, you know, someone needs to start somewhere. Somebody needs to be... Uh, adopting these principles um, and, and you know, it's, it's a good place to start with the um, NRINs. Okay, but we have some practical help, um, so we need to go away and work out how to do this. So we have actually um, uh, produced an implementation guide uh, that's available on the MANUS website. So um, this is quite a detailed, I think something like a 50 page document. Um, but it's broken down by each action, so these are the sort of specific actions with configuration examples of um, uh, you know, how you can implement each of the, the, uh, the four manners actions. So I'm 
if nothing else, even if you don't join Manners, please take a read of that and read some of the ideas and uh, configuration examples in that. But this is where NRENs can also help us. So we're also looking at Manners training and certification process. Um, so whilst we have this implementation guide, um, we're also looking to develop, or well, actually we are developing um, uh, some online training modules. Um, so these, the aim is to walk a student through the tutorial and have the test at the end. Um, but what we are actually looking for are a number of partners to help uh, push this, um, uh, uh, these training modules. So if you're running, for example, network training courses or you're, doing, uh, you're teaching students in a university, um, we can work with you, you can work with us um, with, these, uh, with this uh, manners training. Um, so we're encouraging people to, to, to get involved and, and to um, uh, participate in this process, particularly in the R&E space. Um, ultimately, we're wanting to look to achieve a manners certification, so manners will you know, be able to go through and perform a number of checks um, on a network, see if they, you know, they do actually perform to these technical principles, um, that's the next stage, um, but we're actually looking for partners to help us uh, develop that certification as well. Um, so that's something I think that NRENs can, 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 can be involved with, uh, absolutely. So this is my last slide. Um, you know, the, the message is, you know, can you publicly stand up publicly and say that you care about routing security and you're prepared to spend resources on this? Uh, and actually you're prepared to be held accountable by not only your community but um, the internet, the wider internet community as well. So if you're interested, please go to the URL to the Manners website and the information is there. Um, I appreciate there's a limited time and there's another uh, uh, conference has joined us so I will um, finish off there. I don't know if there's any questions, very quick, but... Um, Thank you.